Yeah. I, I don't know if you as a head of state went to the COP in Dubai. Let me stop Dubai. you right there. Let me stop you right there. Do you know that Guyana has a forest forever that is the size of England and Scotland combined? A forest that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon? A forest that we have kept alive? A forest that we have kept alive. Does that give you the right? No, Does no, that no, no. give you I, the that, right that, to release that all of this carbon? Right? Does from... that give you the right to, to lecture us on climate change? I am going to lecture you on climate change because we have kept this forest alive that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon that you enjoy, that the world enjoy, that you don't pay us for, that you don't value, that you don't see a value in, that the people of Guyana has kept alive. Guess what? We have the lowest deforestation rate in the world. And guess what? Even with our greatest exploration of the oil and gas resource we have now, we will still be uh, net zero. Guyana will still be net zero. With all our exploration, a couple of we'll points. still be net zero. No, no, there's no, no powerful, no, powerful no, no, words, no, no, no. Mr. President. Well, 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 but a, a couple. I, I'm not completed as yet. I am not finished as yet. I am just not finished as yet. Because this is the hypocrisy that exists in the world. We, the world in the last 50 years, has lost 65% of all its biodiversity. We have kept our biodiversity. Are you valuing it? Are you ready to pay for it? When is the developed world is going well, to pay for it? Or are you, you in the pockets? You, are you in the pockets of those who have damaged the environment? Are you in the pockets? Are you and your system in the pockets of those who destroyed the environment through the industrial revolution and now lecturing us? Are you in their pockets? Are you paid by them? Are you paid right, to keep right, their Mr. message alive? There is no hypocrisy in our position. The Center for International there, Environmental there no Law has described the oil and gas production in Guyana as turning your country from, as you rightly put it, a carbon sink into a potential, quote, carbon bomb. Now, you may say you have every right that, to exploit that, that, that is, oil that and gas. That is ridiculous. We, even with our, even with exploring, and, and, and production of all our resources, we are going to still be carbon neutral. We are still going to be carbon neutral. Let me quote to you Greenpeace, who say quite simply, to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, and you know that your own country is one of the most vulnerable to climate change, because most, most of your population lives and, below and, and, sea and, and level. And we have paid, guess what? Guess what? We have paid for the mitigation. We have paid for the adop uh, adaptation. We are the ones who have to find revenue. So to, no, 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 no. I, want to I haven't we finished telling you what level. Greenpeace says. Yes, but let me tell Greenpeace say we need to keep the majority of the world's remaining fossil fuels in the ground. Yeah, Greenpeace can say You're that. You're not doing that. Greenpeace and you can say that. But we need to get resources and the developing world, we need to get resources to build the sea defenses. We need to get sea defenses to build the drainage and irrigation system. You just said that we're six feet below sea level. Who is going to pay for the infrastructure? Who is going to pay for the drainage and irrigation? Who is going to pay for the development and advancement of our country? Are you going to pay? It's not coming from anywhere. It's not coming from Greenpeace or anyone else. Look at the adaptation budget that is required for the developing world. Where is the money coming from? Isn't there a cynicism here in Georgetown, best expressed by your vice president, who said recently, because there is this climate change imperative to decarbonize, our policy is to get as much oil out of the ground as quickly as possible. Now he said, that's harsh for those who think that you should be environmentally sound, but that is the reality of it. Those were very honest words from your vice president. And that is what we are, honest. We are practical. So you're we're, rushing, rushing to get this oil practical. out before we, any deal is that, done that, to quote you, Dubai COP to transition away from oil and you, gas. You can say we are rushing, but we are very practical. We have this natural resource and we are going to aggressively pursue this natural resource mm. because we have to develop our country. We are committed to the development of this region. We have to create the opportunity for our people because no one is bringing that for us. You, you, no one is bringing that for us. No one is paying our agenda. Just a, no a, one is paying our a, agenda. A, a final thought about what this means inside your own country. Earlier on, I referred to the fact that 40% of the Guyanese population currently still lives in poverty. And according to USAID from a recent report, Guyana's political instability, which we also referred to, raises concerns that the country is unprepared for its newfound wealth. The tremendous influx of money opens many avenues for corruption. How do you as president ensure that that doesn't happen? So when we came into government, we said that there are a number of things that we must do. 
first of all, there must be an arm's length, rela arm's length relationship with the uh, oil revenue. So first, the Minister of Finance has to declare all the revenue that comes into the system. If he does not declare that uh, within 30 days, there's a 10-year mandatory jail term for the Minister of Finance. Secondly, any revenue that is spent from oil and gas must pass through the budgetary process. So it has to go through the Parliament. It has to be debated in the Parliament. It then comes into the system. It is then audited by the Auditor General at the end of what it was intended for. And then, of course, the investment decision is made by a committee that is arms sent away, an independent committee that is arms sent away from the government. Yeah. Just a final thought on the politics. You, you, you described the tensions around the 2020 election. It was hotly disputed. I think it's fair to say that there's a clear sort of ethnic element to the politics of Guyana. Your party is predominantly Indo-Guyanese. No, the opposition... We're, we're, we're the only national party. Well, that's what you say. But we're the only, nonetheless... But when you go on the ground, and I invite you to our Congress, you will see the representation of party. We but are I, the I only refer to the opposition party. leader, Aubrey Norton, from the opposition well, national well, now Congress. You're saying, so, so now you're saying that in the words of the opposition leader. No, I, I want to pursue the words he recently yeah. said, where he said that given everything that your government is doing with the oil money, to quote him, a one-party state is emerging in Guyana. There are fears that the money you have access to is entrenching your political supremacy. Well, well first of all, let me uh, address an issue. You have to give me a few moments. The ethnic division of this country was instigated by external forces. So, you know, it's very ironical how the United States always pretend to be very righteous. They always pretend that they care about the interest of other citizens in other countries, but they've always acted uh, the opposite. Now, they drink wine and they preach water, or rather they preach water and they drink wine. Remember what happened in Libya. In Libya, um, the president, Muammar Gaddafi, was kicked out. Why was that? He was kicked out because he was trying to bring a unification of Africa. He wanted a United States of Africa. Guess what? The Westerners knew that if Africa was going to be united, it's go it was going to be a problem for them because it's easier to control a part than the whole. To control a singular African country will be easier but to control the massive entire 54 African countries as one is going to be a challenge. That is how Muammar Gaddafi looked at, looked at Africa, and he was being a threat for the people of NATO and the West. Also, another thing that we cannot underlook is that there was oil in Libya. There is oil. Any country that has oil is always a very, very uh, unstable country. We have Nigeria. Nigeria, we have the terror group called Boko Haram. Um, when we go all the way to Iraq, remember in 2003, uh, the president of Iraq, uh, Saddam, um, Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein was killed. He was killed by uh, the American government. Uh, he was also killed by the Tony Blair. Tony Blair, who was by then the prime minister of England or the UK, uh, arranged for the murder of uh, Saddam Hussein, you know, Saddam Hussein, when you ask around or when you do your proper research, you'll realize that he was only fighting for the unification of the Arab countries. During Saddam Hussein's rule in Iraq, Iraq was a very more stable country uh, in the Middle East. Right now we have countries such as Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is doing really good because they have an agreement. The prince of Saudi Arabia has a very interesting uh, agreement with the president now joe biden he knows that he can't f with the president of saudi with the prince of saudi arabia because right now america cannot import oil from russia they all depend on saudi arabia now they cannot make things bad for him in saudi arabia so they have to make the arrangement and agreement and the relationship america has to maintain it to be good because they know when they full up Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker, and today I am in Guyana, South America, a country of some 800,000 people, which right now 
can claim to have the fastest growing economy in the world. The reason? Oil. Vast reserves of the stuff located offshore. My guest today is Guyana's president, Irfan Ali. His country's newfound oil riches have stoked tensions with neighboring Venezuela. They've also raised questions about this country's vulnerability to climate change. So, is oil really a blessing or a curse? President Irfan Ali, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Mr. President, you lead a country which by many measures has the fastest growing economy in the world. It is down to you to ensure that this massive windfall your country has is used wisely and fairly. Do you feel the pressure? I don't think uh, it's a pressure. It definitely is a challenge but it is an opportunity. And to understand uh, this growth and what it means for our country, I think you have to have an appreciation also uh, from where we came and the type of difficulties we have overcome as a country uh, to be where we are today. And that gives you an understanding as to the starting point. And the starting point for Guyana has never been oil and gas. Uh, we, have, we are a country that came through a very painful past uh, 28 years of dictatorship. We had uh, democracy re, uh, re reinstalled in 1992 and then from then we, ha we were the second poorest country in the hemisphere. Our debt to GDP ratio was insanely high. We were using 98 cents on every dollar to repay foreign debt. Without oil and gas uh, we managed to bring that down to 5 cents uh, on every dollar in the repayment of uh, foreign debt. And then, of course, we had challenges uh, in the last elections uh, when the last government, after losing the elections uh, and losing a low con no confidence motion, took some time. It took some time to get them to accept the results and to have democracy maintain its position. Yeah, and that, that actually for a while looked like it was going to be deeply problematic. There is a fragility to politics here, which we will discuss in a moment, but just to stick with this idea of the unbelievable transformation yes. in your economy. In terms of your GDP, it's rising exponentially. 60% the year before last, 30% last year. No other country in the world is experiencing this, and it just seems to me that oil and gas and the revenues you're getting could overwhelm Guyana. Well, I don't think it can overwhelm Guyana. What this new wealth is allowing us to do is to create a country that is competitive in all the areas that we have potential in. So, for example, Guyana has always been rich in natural resources. We have a lot of raw materials. We have tremendous arable lands and fresh water. We have never been able to be competitive for a number of reasons. The country lacked the infrastructure. Uh, now we are fixing the, the infrastructure that is opening up new lands, new lands for housing, new lands for agriculture, integrating more Guyana with northern Brazil. So we are building a new highway uh, to integrate northern Brazil. This gives us the possibility of developing a deep water port. So the build out of the country from an infrastructural standpoint, a social standpoint, and importantly, building a health care and education system that is second to none is what is important for us. Now, but, but, all of these investments are also critical for us to bring back the huge diaspora that migrated during the period of dictatorship. All of those big ambitions you have depend on stability. And one of the problems you've got right now is that your enormous new wealth has stirred resentment in your neighbor, Venezuela, which has for long seen a territory, Essequibo, which is two-thirds of your landmass, as rightfully theirs. And Nicolas Maduro, president of Venezuela, is now saying he will take that land. This land, Guyana, was settled in 1899. Our boundaries were settled 
Venezuela participated in the settlement of the, uh, of the boundaries. The Venezuelans the say that was a colonial agreement, illegitimate, and it is indeed true to say that right now the International Court of Justice is considering the legitimacy of Venezuela's claim. No, 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 no. What, 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 I'll come to what the ICJ is considering. In 1899, Venezuela accepted the boundaries. The country Venezuela accepted the boundaries. They, they even enacted local laws that accepted the boundaries. They participated with Guyana and Brazil in establishing the tri, the, the, the tri marker point in setting out the, uh, the pause for this, uh, with the surveyors and the boundary. So Venezuela participated fully. When we were about to become uh, independent, they raised a controversy. That controversy that they raise is what is before the ICT. With the greatest respect, we could spend the next hour talking about the International uh, Court of Justice and the case, but I don't want to do that. I just want to talk about practical realities. The reality is that Maduro organized a referendum last year yes. in Venezuela, which overwhelmingly backed the idea that Venezuela should reincorporate, or incorporate, as you would put it, this territory into the Venezuelan state. If that were to happen, you would lose your rights to drill and produce oil and gas offshore, off the coast of well, Essequibo. Well, well, first of all, we will not allow that to happen. And that is why we, we, we are before the ICJ, because we believe in the international rule of law. We are a peaceful country. We are a democratic country. We believe in regional stability, and we are before the ICJ. Sure, but, said, but uh, with the greatest respect, you're also a country with a military and I'm security force of, what, 4,000 men yeah, at yeah, best. I'm, Venezuela I'm, can call upon 150,000 men. I'm coming to that. So, but before that, I must establish the point that our first line of defense has always been diplomacy, and we respect the international law and the outcome of the court, the ICJ. However, we recognize that we are dealing with a neighbor that is aggressive, that has made certain threats, and we are investing in our military, we are investing in the technology of our military, we are investing in infrastructure. But more than that, we have aligned ourselves with countries and a region that is on the side of Guyana. The CARICOM as a region has issued statement in support of Ghana sovereignty. The US has issued statement in support of Ghana sovereignty. The UK has issued statement in support of Ghana sovereignty. France has issued statement in support of Ghana sovereignty. Canada. So we are working on the basis of an international coalition that would not allow uh, this region to be dis destabilized so by any action by Venezuela to uh, to overrun our territorial integrity or our borders. But have you seen the satellite imagery which shows that uh, armored vehicles have gathered close to the border with Essequibo on the Venezuelan side, that they have armed coastal vessels, again, gathered close to your waters? Well, what I'm saying is that we have made it very clear that if there is any breach in our territorial space, if there is any action by anyone to destabilize our country and to invade in any way, shape, or form that we will call upon every force and every friend to help us and to work with us to pr protect our territorial integrity. Let's talk about a different aspect of the oil and gas bonanza. Your relationship with the key oil corporation which undertook the exploration and undertakes much of the production, that is Exxon. They've been here from the very beginning. Yes. Why did Guyana give Exxon such an extraordinarily sweet deal which gives them an unprecedented amount of economic gain from their work here? Well, first of all, uh, this, this uh, agreement was made under the last government. We and have, you have not have changed all, it, Mr. President? Yes, no, and I'm coming to that because there is uh, something called sanctity of contract. What message are we going to send to international investors? If you have a contract and then you just change the contract. When Exxon came to Guyana to explore for oil, they came to explore for oil. There was no, no one said oil is here. They invested, they explored for oil. After they would have completed the exploration, they found oil. After they found oil, there's a production sharing agreement that was signed by the last government.
an agreement that was signed by the last government. You only get, if I may say so, and of course no, you, no, I, I, you we, only get 2% royalties. It's a 50% profit share after cost recovery. And, and, and the cost recovery, as I understand it, is going into the many billions of dollars already, i.e. Exxon is basically saying, we're not going to give you much of a share of this because think about the vast expense we have had developing these no, oil No, no, I, I think, I think that's, that's totally a misconception. First of all, I'm agreeing with you that it was a bad deal. We have said this publicly, but we cannot move from a bad deal to a situation where you, 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 you unilaterally change a contract. Simple question. Is, that is sense, Guyana being exploited right now by Exxon? L I'll, I'll come to Simple your question. question. I, I wouldn't say that we're being exploited by Exxon. We signed an agreement as a country with Exxon. We cannot unilaterally change that agreement. What we committed ourselves to do as the new government is to ensure that no new PSA would have those similar terms. And we've already changed the PSA to, more, to be more balanced in terms of giving the country the best possible revenue, but more importantly, in ensuring that we don't also dis, uh, create a, a situation where investment in the sector is, uh, is curtailed because of, of, of the PSA. But the, Mr. President, I just want to be very straight with you. We're sitting here together, the yes. two of us, in a luxury hotel in Georgetown, and outside this door there is a fancy conference expo in which many corporate leaders from big oil around the world are sniffing around the opportunities in your country. And at the very same time, we have a report from Global Witness, the anti-corruption people, saying that if a deal had been done with the more usual royalty and cost agreements like we've seen in other parts of the world, then Guyana would stand to gain another $50 billion from your oil and gas so, reserves, so, money you are not going to get. How can you tell so, the people so, of your own country, many of them living in poverty, that this deal that you are currently operating under to get the oil and gas out of the ground is a good deal for Did them? I say it's a good deal? I said that the deal was uh, heavily skewed to Exxon. We have said this publicly. You're not getting it. We have said that the deal was heavily skewed to Exxon. But we cannot unilaterally change the agreement that the last government signed. That Why not? Say, no, no, no. That will send a tremendous... It's like you asking me. It's like I asking you. You agree that slavery was bad and the greatest indignity to humankind. Why not pay uh, reparation? Why not value reparation and pay reparation today? The tens of billions of dollars that... that, that but uh, Mr. That President, you don't allow slavery to continue just because no, there were certain contracts that no, were signed. No, no, no. You, as a politician, have made a great noise about demanding, for example, reparations for slavery yes. from the United Kingdom. Yes. And yet here we are in a new era for an independent Guyana, where you're saying to me, you know what, it's true, we are being exploited. The extractive industries I, are exploiting our I, people. I, I, and you just sit here you, and you, you take you, it. No, you, you, are, you are placing words that I've not said. I have not said that we're being exploited. I have said that a contract signed by the last government, the contract that was signed by the last government was heavily skewed to the investor. And we have said that. And I've said to you that as a new government, we cannot unilaterally change that it's, contract. It's not just, if I may say so, it's not just about the finances, the royalties, the expenses that Exxon demands. It's also about things like insurance. There's an extraordinary case last year in the Guyanan courts where the court decided that your own Environmental Protection Agency and Exxon had failed to provide the necessary guarantees that any oil spill would, in the end, be fully paid for in terms of cleanup by Exxon's parent company. We have said, and what we are doing, what are we doing to address these issues? Right now, we are drafting, uh, uh, redrafting environmental laws to take care of this. Soon we'll have in you the... Haven't, you haven't taken care of it, even though the, the drilling is taking place every so, single day. If there was a massive oil spill tomorrow, can you tell your own people that Guyana, and indeed the rest of the Caribbean, would be fully recompensed by Exxon? What I can say is that there are systems in place in the operational, operations of Manuel, um, uh, operations of Exxon, to take care of this.
their systems in place. Let's take a big picture look at what's going on here. Over the next uh, decade, two decades, it is uh, expected that there will be $150 billion worth of oil and gas extracted off your coast. It's an extraordinary figure, but think of it in practical terms. That means, according to many experts, more than 2 billion tonnes of carbon emissions will come from your seabed, from those reserves, and be released into the atmosphere. I, I don't know if you as a head of state went to the COP Let in Dubai. Let me stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. Do you know that Guyana has a forest forever that is the size of England and Scotland combined? A forest that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon? A forest that we have kept alive? A forest that we have kept alive. Does that give you the right? No, does no, that no, no, give no. you the does right that, to release that all of this right? carbon? Does from that give you the right to, to lecture us on climate change? I am going to lecture you on climate change because we have kept this forest alive that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon that you enjoy, that the world enjoy, that you don't pay us for, that you don't value, that you don't see a value in, that the people of Ghana has kept alive. Guess what? We have the lowest deforestation rate in the world. And guess what? Even with our greatest exploration of the oil and gas resource we have now, we will still be uh, net zero. Guyana will still be net zero. With all our exploration, we will points. still be net zero. No, no, pa there's no, no... Powerful, no, powerful no, no, words, no, no, no. Mr. President. Hold, hold, hold. But a, a couple. I, I'm not completed as yet. I am not finished as yet. I am just not finished as yet. Because this is the hypocrisy that exists in the world. We, the world in the last 50 years, has lost 65% of all its biodiversity. We have kept our biodiversity. Are you valuing it? Are you ready to pay for it? When is the developed world going well, to pay for it? Or are you, you in the pockets? You, are you in the pockets of those who have damaged the environment? Are you in the pockets? Are you and your system in the pockets of those who destroyed the environment through the industrial revolution and now lecturing us? Are you in their pockets? Are you paid by them? Are you all paid right, to keep right, their Mr. messages? President. Life, there is no hypocrisy in our position. The Center for there, International there Environmental no Law hypocrisy. has described the oil and gas production in Guyana as turning... It's over for them. America is not going to be powered. The thing I've noticed with this president of Guyana, he was easy to listen. And the journalist was kind of poking. The journalist seemed to be some kind of authority above him. Come on. This is president of Guyana. Irfan Ali Mohammed is a president and you're just a journalist and you're in his country. You have to show respect to the people you interview. Have respect for the heads of state. This person is uh, in as much as he's controlling a very small country with a population of 800,000 individuals. That makes him so, so powerful, you know. And also, if you didn't know, Guyana is one of the fastest growing economies in the not even one of the fastest. It is the fastest growing economy in the world. And now Guyana has now realized there is oil in their country. And so Venezuela realizing, hey, Guyana is having oil. We have to take two thirds of that land from them and make it ours. Because remember what's happening. In the past, we didn't have countries like we have today. These countries were established, particularly in Africa, these countries were established by the Berlin Conference of 1886. The Berlin Conference saw um, Africans, African countries were divided, and these divisions were called spheres of influences. These spheres of influences were easy to control because the Europeans were fighting all over the place for Africa, and now they had to divide the elephant. One went with the stake, Another one with the trunk, another one with the front foot, another one with the tummy, another one with the kidney. And these parts, they call them the spheres of influence. You would find that, for example, in Kenya, Mount Kilimanjaro was part of Kenya. But when the British and the Germans came, they took, the Germans took uh, Mount Kilimanjaro from Kenya. And now Mount Kilimanjaro became part of Tanzania, but not part of Kenya. And now... If something good has been realized in Mount Kilimanjaro, let's say we have oil in Mount Kilimanjaro, do you think Kenya would come back and say, hey, we want that Mount Kilimanjaro back, it was ours? We have to accept terms. The white man came, 
he divided us he established a laws in a thing called statutes these statutes are imprinted in a very well documented platform uh, established in the Hague Hague where we have the International Court Ju- Court of Justice the ICJ the ICJ is like the whip of the UN once the UN establishes that this is a country that is how it should be taken we agreed with the consequences of the Berlin conference for example what is happening in Guyana is that Guyana may have been part of Venezuela in the past but as the president said in 1899 Guyana developed itself or the Guyana was separated from Venezuela for from 1899 till now in 2024 now that oil has been re- discovered in Guyana it might be not today that it has been discovered but it's so recent is when Venezuela is coming and saying no we want that land back Venezuela Guyana is part of us you know and come to think of it who is fueling this you've heard how this president has talked you can easily tell he is not a man who is going to be easily controlled by the west now the west this is my ideology the west might be trying to find a shortcut trying to find a means of reaching Guyana's oil they don't need Guyana they don't care about the people of Guyana like Michael Jackson says they don't care about us yeah that's Michael Jackson now they're trying to find a means a long hand to reach Guyana and tap on that oil remember wherever there is oil there is always conflict a bl- oil does not have to be a curse it is it is always going to be a curse when we have greedy greedy people people who are living far away coming all the way from where they're living to here to stir up conflicts like the thing which is happening in DRC the people of DRC are not the one bringing this conflict it is people from the outside world the west everyone is coming there very far from their home bringing conflict here a natural resource does not have to be a curse and the president is right the west are hypocrites they have committed the worst of crime Henry Kissinger Henry Kissinger killed a lot of people Henry Kissinger deleted a lot of individuals in Africa in South America in Asia Cambodia Henry Kissinger was very much respected actually when he died he was he was honored like a warrior we call them shuja but no he was he was someone else if Henry Kissinger was a character in an african country or he was a character in a middle eastern country what would have happened you would have seen choppers and everything all over the place looking for him but since he is an individual who is coming from the west he was appreciated in fact he was applauded for his evil deeds remember i'm yet to tell you something about subjective and objective morality henry kissinger was both subjectively and objectively immoral and that's what i know that is what the world thinks of henry kissinger and for the president of guyana congratulations man you spoke your mind you spoke for the people of guyana and you really did a nice work on this So, I have a question that I want to ask you. What do you understand by the term morality? Something might be right in a certain place, let's say Kenya, where I come from right now. Something might be acceptable to the people of Kenya. But when I move to the neighboring country, when I move to Uganda, the same thing that was acceptable in Kenya is not acceptable in Uganda. And then when I go to the next country, say Tanzania, I realize it's acceptable. And then when I move to the next country, say Malawi, I realize it is not acceptable. Why is this? This is because um things that are working for some people might not work for other people. And so there comes a point, there comes a point where we realize we don't have the absolute morality. What we have is the subjective morality. And so something such as homosexuality it might seem right to the eyes of the westerners to promote it to bring it upon africans but africans we have our own laws we don't accept homosexuality it's not part of us as africans to do such things because it's immoral yeah the video is not hom- the video is not about homosexuality but it's about hypocrisy now there are two types of truths and there is two levels or categories of morality We have the absolute morality and we have the subjective morality. 
the absolute morality is a morality we, where is independent it is it is not uh, contingent it is a necessary thing you know it is not contingent but necessary for example uh, you will find that people might be looking at the united states as the epitome of morality some people might be thinking of that but then when i move to middle east or when i go to libya and i ask the libyan or the middle easterns what do you think of the united states should the world look at the united states as the teachers of morality you will be surprised many people will say no some will say yes and so there is no particular Afri- there is no particular country which is superior on the other in terms of morality because africans or people of even non africans when they are asked do you think the united states is an epitome of morality they say no it is not it can never be and here is where my point comes in my point comes where there's this journalist uh he's from bbc he has this series of videos where he calls them hard talks hard talks interviews this uh this gentleman this white gentleman from the bbc has been able to interview many and so many african leaders including julius malema including yoweri museveni uh, in, he interviewed including um who is this paul kagame he interviewed including the south african leaders and so i'm always intrigued by how he asks these questions he asks them disrespectfully and i'm always left with this question on mind would he ask people f- would he ask his leaders the same questions he is asking these african leaders you will be surprised no 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 he won't do that he respects his own leaders but when he moves to africa i think he does not respect african leaders and this is not my subjective opinion this is an opinion i'm gathering from how he asks the questions to these african leaders so in this particular interview he is interviewing the president of guyana yeah the guyanese president uh, someone ali the brother ali and ali was very vocal he came up and spoke his mind openly you know ali was able to say no you people are hypocrites there's no way we can look at the united states of america as the epitome of morality there's no way the united states of america can dictate to the world what they got to do in fact the world should teach united states what they got to do there are so many crimes that the united states have done to the people of the whole world you know kenya libya we have uh, south america asia middle east australia everywhere you go you'll always find people crying of the united states of america why are they crying if somebody is so good and somebody is always forcing their ideas on you why are people complaining about them we have the oil issue wherever there is oil or wherever there is a natural resource the united states of america is always involved it is always involved but why when it is involved something bad always happens you know a, fr- a-, a goat cannot be friend a cheetah goat and cheetah can never be friends you can never say i'm taking my goat i'm going to tether my horse my goat in the forest a forest that you well know is infested by cheetahs what do you expect when you turn in the evening you'll find bones you'll find blood you'll find fur you won't find your goat in one piece and this is what the united states is to some of these african countries the guyanese president has realized the hypocrisy that is there with these african with these uh, western countries they tend to pretend they are the ones imposing human rights while they are the ones who are taking away these human rights from humans themselves humans from countries which they deem not superior and when they want their own things to be done they plant their seed they plant their leaders a leaders who will help them run their their things you know and the guyanese president i never thought he would come up and speak in such a way you know and again for me this this interviewer this interviewer is uh, kind of disrespectful you don't talk to a head of state like that you don't talk to a head of state like you are equals no actually there's a verse in proverbs where it tells you uh, it it talks about when you are dining with the king don't think you are 
he's equal no you are not an equal to the king he can easily do this and disappear and there has to be respect for african leaders there has to be respect for people for the heads of states when you look at the guyanese president you can easily tell by the physical that this person has african ancestry he has a darker skin you know and guyana is an island in the caribbean what do you expect many of the caribbean islands were places where after slaves were captured by the british by the spanish by all these people some of them were placed on these caribbean islands we have cuba cuba has a high population of black people jamaica maybe the highest we have um guyana we have puerto rico puerto rico though it's not in the caribbean it's in the americas but you find these islands around america having a high population of black people why it's as a result of slavery that placed them there and so because these people are redeemed you are here because of slavery and because slavery ended during the french revolution these people are still active up to now they think they can just push the buttons and take you up and down like they used to do during the slave trade no 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 i think it has to end and we need more leaders like the guyanese president we'll need more leaders like ibrahim traore we need more leaders like uh, Julius Malema people who are not afraid of speaking their minds for the Africans and on the interest of the Africans that's my say for today and i think the president of Guyana really did a nice work uh, speaking about uh, the interest and the hypocrisy of the west the west can never be an epitome of morality no way no way i will not learn how to eat grass from the cheetah I rather learn how to eat grass from the cow or from the sheep. Son you shall know them by their fruit. You shall just know them by their fruit. There is no way avocado will give apples. There is no way pineapples will give guavas. There is no way that will happen. Maybe in some weird universe is where you'll find this happening. Yes. Speaking of the weird universe, this is the weird universe of YouTube. Kindly subscribe to the channel, uh, support me on Patreon, join my members and give me a super thanks. Give a super thanks. It helps me bring more informative and helpful videos to you. Subscribe, um join my Patreon, become a member, give the video a super thanks and share with your friends. See you in the next one.